Are you happy with your amplified double bass tone? If so, keep surfing. If not, keep watching this video for some tips and theories for finding your true tone every time. To pre or not to pre? That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the chain to buffer the ohms in plenty of outrageous impedance or to take arms against the troubles of loading and by buffer and to die to sleep no more and by asleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand wheels of I'm so weak. These are the immortal words of Hamlet, forever engraved in our culture by Billy Shakespeare, a distant cousin of William Shakespeare. You have chosen and bought your pickup, you've mounted it on your base, and now the question arises, do I need a preamp to go with it? This is one of the most common questions people have when it comes to amplifying the double bass or in fact any other instrument you would attach a piezo pickup to. Many manufacturers claim that no preamp is needed with their pickup. Here are a few quotes. Manufacturer number one claims on their website, it's not necessary to use a preamp with our pickup. The pickup simply amplifies the acoustic sound of your instrument without coloring it. The benefits of a preamp are that they can make up for shortcomings in your instrument's acoustic sound. They can boost the highs or the lows or fill in some mids that might not be present enough. No matter how high the quality of your components is, more links in the chain from your instrument to the speaker will change the original texture slightly. They also write, the pickup is a high impedance transducer. The pickup is rated at 10 mega ohms. Manufacturer number two writes, an impedance matching preamp is recommended, but not required. This will help realize the full frequency response potential of the pickup. According to manufacturer two, the impedance of their pickup is 10 mega ohms. Manufacturer number three simply claims no preamp needed. Their pickup is rated at over one mega ohm. This was the most precise info I was given from the sales rep. A short comment here. It seems logical that the impedance values the manufacturer one and two are talking about is recommended input load and not the impedance of the piezo pickup, while manufacturer number three is talking about the impedance of the pickup itself. The numbers make more sense when we think of them this way. Let's get some semantics out of the way. All three manufacturers claim that no preamp is needed. Manufacturer number one even suggests that adding something between the pickup and the amp can negatively affect the signal as it's more links in the chain from your instrument to the speaker. Manufacturer number two, on the other hand, hints at the truth when they suggest that an impedance matching preamp is recommended but not required. This will help realize the full frequency response potential of the pickup. Think about this. What this quote is actually saying is that while it's correct that you don't need a buffering device, not using one implies that you're willing to accept something less than the full frequency response potential of your pickup. This impedance matching preamp that manufacturer number two is referring to manages to confuse many things within the borders of just three words. First, we're not looking to match impedances as we're about to learn. We actually get the best results if the input impedance of your amp or DI is at least 10 times the impedance of the pickup. Secondly, a preamp does not help us at all if the input impedance of the preamp is not sufficiently high. 
And lastly, it confuses buffers with preamps and makes the whole issue of amplifying with piezo pickups a hazy mess. To clarify, a buffer is a device with a high input impedance and a low output impedance. It doesn't amplify and it doesn't have tone controls. A preamp has tone controls and filters might have compression, may or may not incorporate a buffer as part of its input. So, what does all this business of impedance buffering mean? I'll let Mr. Ian Doru of the Lean Audio Company, a company that specializes in, among other things, impedance optimizing of piezo pickups, explain. Every pickup signal source has an output impedance, although this is usually not published. Every input has an input impedance. This is usually published. The input impedance should be at least 10 times higher than the source's output impedance, so the input, your amplifier or DI, doesn't significantly load the pickup and reduce its output level. Impedance is measured in ohms. Kilo ohms, that's thousands of ohms, or mega ohms, millions of ohms. What happens if the input impedance is less than 10 times the source impedance? If the source is a piezo pickup, the lowest frequencies will be attenuated. If the source is a magnetic pickup, the highest frequencies, harmonics in particular, will be attenuated. We can picture the relationship between the source and input impedance by using an analogy of a garden hose. The thin garden hose is the impedance of the pickup. The nozzle attached to the hose represents the input of your amp or DI, and the water pressure is our wanted signal. If you open the water flow and close the nozzle, the input impedance, the nozzle, is at its highest. The water pressure is high, but the flow of water is zero. This equates to an input impedance of infinity, which is impossible to achieve in the real world. If you open the nozzle a little bit, the input impedance at the nozzle is still high, the pressure is also high, and the flow is small. This is the condition we want for our pickup, the highest possible pressure. Open the nozzle further, and the input impedance at the nozzle starts to fall. The pressure in the hose drops off, but the flow of water increases. This will be like feeding the pickup into a base amp or regular DI. We have an unwanted pressure drop. Plugging a piezo pickup with ultra high impedance into an input expecting a much lower impedance is like trying to wash your car without a nozzle. There's just not enough flow to maintain any kind of pressure. A piezo pickup's impedance is not a constant number it increases as the frequency decreases. Therefore, if we plug into an input with a too low impedance, we end up with the lower parts of the frequency spectrum being noticeably reduced, which is very bad news for us as bass players. Piezo pickups are by nature ultra high impedance devices. They lie in the mega ohms of impedance values where traditional magnetic pickups found on electric bass guitars lie in the kilo ohms of impedance values. Most bass players will be plugging into a bass amp and most of these are built primarily with a bass guitar in mind, meaning their inputs are expecting a source with an impedance in the kilo ohms range. When they get a source in the several mega ohms range instead, it's like the garden hose with an open nozzle. Full flow of water, no pressure. And as we've already discussed, most notably the lowest frequencies will be reduced. The higher the impedance of the pickup and the lower the input impedance, the worse the problem. Take a look at this graph from the webpage of Leon Audio. Here you can see the roll of frequency of three different input loads using a typical piezo source. If you plug a pickup with values like the one in the graph to a typical DI or bass amp with a load of 100 kilo ohms, which is perfectly fine for bass guitars, you'll experience a frequency roll off from 1600 Hz. This is way up in the upper mids. You definitely don't want this. When plugging into a typical guitar or bass amp with an input load of 1 mega ohms, the roll of frequency is around 160 Hz. 
a very noticeable improvement. Most base amps though have inputs in the 200 to 500 kilo ohms range, which would move this cutoff frequency noticeably higher. The third frequency plot in the graph is for a 33 mega ohm load, which is Leon Audio's own active DI built for piezo pickups. And as we can see, it maintains the entire frequency range. The roll off is at 4.8 Hertz, way below any human hearing. This means you're back in control with regard to where you want to limit the bass response. Often on stage, the absolute lowest subs can result in rumbling and feedback, so we would probably want some kind of roll-off in the lowest frequencies. But it's nice to have our own say about this. Definitely not settle for a roll-off at 1600 Hz or worse. I have been using a buffer preamp ever since I read Mr. Rick Turner's article in Bass Player magazine about these things in the early 90s. A few times, I think I can count these on two hands, I've left the buffer behind. I still got sound obviously, but even if it seemed like the sound I got by EQing the amp was good, once the gig started it felt almost like I was disconnected from the instrument. It's a weird feeling and it's not always easy to say exactly what is happening frequency wise. But if we take a look at another graph from Leon Audio's website, we can see what happens when we try to fix the cutoff due to impedance loading by using EQ. As you can see, EQs aren't perfectly flat. In the graph, it's a bell-shaped EQ and it's taken from a well-known mixing desk. But the same issue will apply to any bass amp as well. When we apply a heavy amount of bass on our EQ, we'll perceive more bass, obviously, but it will not result in a linear response. As Leon Audio's website concludes, it's much better to cure the disease than to treat the symptoms. So, the claim the manufacturers I quoted earlier are valid. You don't need a preamp to get sound. But you should at the very least get a buffer of some sort unless you have an amp with at least 10 mega ohm impedance on the input. Some bass amps targeted specifically towards upright bass amplification have these kinds of impedance values on their inputs. Even then, remember that there will be many situations where you'll not bring your amp. You'll be stuck on a stage with an amp or a DI box with an input impedance of 100 kilo ohms or less and wonder where all your low bass went. Now, it's time for some demonstrations. In the test, I'll be using a well-known pickup from one of the manufacturers mentioned in the start of the video. One that was rated at 10 mega ohms. Before making the test, I ordered the cheapest passive DI box I could find. This little guy. There's no name on the box. It simply says passive direct box. It says on the box that the impedance of the instrument input is 50 kilo ohms. I'll also be using my radial PSET DI active DI box. This has a selectable input impedance. The impedances are 50 kilo ohms, 220 kilo ohms, 1 mega ohm, and 10 mega ohms. The first recording will be directly into the no name. Then I'll progress through the various loads available on the radio. Since the no name is passive and the radio has an active buffer, they will have slightly different colorings or quite different colorings. I just thought it would be interesting to hear also the low range of passive DIs in this little test. The basic signal volume will vary quite a lot with the different impedances, so I'll be resetting the input gain to the sound card between each recording. I'll also level match the recordings as well as I can so we don't get fooled by volume differences. Remember, what you'll hear is an absolutely flat recording of the pickup into various loads. No EQs, no compression. Here's a short baseline directly into the passive 50 kilo ohms DI. This is actually a very probable scenario from time to time. We rarely get options of different DIs on a soundcheck, 
and definitely never get any info on the input impedance of the offered DI. As is rather plain to hear, we get a kind of clunky sounding tone with hardly anything in the lower frequency spectrum. To be honest, the roll-off was way more than I thought it would be, but there you go. To save this bass tone would require some rather extreme EQing, which would introduce other artifacts to our tone, such as phasing. We can never make it sound its best like this. Now, Let's try the radial's 50 kilo ohm setting. It's immediately apparent that we have a different color here. Same impedance two different DIs. It's more rounded, the edgy highs are not as troublesome, but we still get quite thin and scratchy lows. Subs are still non-existent. Now, let's see what happens when we set our input low to 220 kilo ohms. We can clearly hear that the lower frequencies are opening up and it's actually starting to sound like a bass. However, I feel the tone is centered more in the lowest mids than in the bass register. The shrilly highs are no longer a problem, which is probably also because of the coloring from the radio. But mainly, to my ears, the fundamentals have moved much lower in the frequency spectrum. We're still missing the subs though. Now let's try the 1 mega ohm setting. Here, I feel we're getting even closer to some proper bass tone. The fundamentals have shifted slightly more down and we're now more or less in bass territory. The mids are still here, but they're not as harsh or dominating as before. Finally, here's a 10 mega ohm setting. I can feel a nuance from the previous setting. The pickup is blossoming and opening up. The frequency range is balanced and we have a pleasant blend of subs, lows and mids. Let's listen to all five recordings quickly in order. When we listen to the recordings in order like this, it's quite obvious that the first, the passive DI, is brittle, there's not a lot of bottom end going on at all, it's quite harsh sounding. When we switch over to the radio that has a, uh, an active buffer, then immediately we lose some of the brittle top, or most of it, but in the 50 kilo ohms uh, setting on the radio, still we're missing the, the, lower, the lower frequencies, almost entirely. It opens up to 220, further up to 1 meg, and the whole spectrum is, a, is there when we get to 10 mega ohms. 
Considering the fact that this test is in no way scientific, the shift in frequency balance is exceptional. I urge you to listen to the examples through a good pair of headphones. Then the differences will be even more obvious. We've all spent hours honing our skills on the double bass, working on our tone, buying expensive instruments, pickups and amps. So why would we not get the full frequency range out of it? Would you settle for this tone? Or do you prefer this? The main thing to take away from all this is always to be thoughtful of the first thing you plug your pickup into. Make sure you have a knowledge of its impedance value and if you want uncompromised frequency range, make sure this is of at least 10 mega ohms. This can be done either through a dedicated buffer, a preamp including a minimum 10 mega ohm buffer stage or a DI with an impedance of at least 10 mega ohms or one of the dedicated amps built for piezo pickups. Don't make the mistake of plugging the bass into a pedal before the buffer. <laughs> I did this myself for a while, a few years back. I would plug the bass into my tuner and compressor pedals and then patch into the preamp with 10 mega ohm input. The problem here is that the pickup now sees the first device as a load, in my case the 1 mega input of the boss tuner, for instance, rather than the more appropriate 10 mega ohm input of the preamp. This defies everything we've learned, as the tuner, in my case, was loading the pickup with its 1 mega ohm impedance and shaving off my low frequencies. You should also take into consideration the fact that if you've been playing bass for years with an attenuated low end due to impedance loading, when you suddenly get all this low end back, everything might seem very strange at first. Your best solution to this is to use the amp's EQ in ways that you're not used to. You'd need to roll off a lot of bass, obviously. Maybe you'd want to add an EQ in after your preamp or buffer, before the amp, if the amp's controls are not enough. One thing you definitely don't want to do is have a DI with an ultra-high impedance, like the radio I'm using in the video, and hooking the unbuffered through up to an amp. When you plug the through output of a DI into an amp or some other load, the pickup will see the load of the DI's buffer in parallel with the amp's load. To find the total load for this, you would need to use the formula here on the screen. In the formula, R1 is the first load, R2 is the second load, and RT is the loads combined. I'll demonstrate this problem. In the following, I'm recording the bass through the radial in 10 mega ohms. It's connected to my interface and the through jack is buffered. I have connected a jack to the cheap 50 kilo ohm DI. Its signal is not going anywhere, it's simply to demonstrate what happens with this load in parallel to the 10 mega ohms. As long as the through is taken after the buffer, the pickup sees only the 10 mega ohm load of the radio. In the example, after a few seconds, I simply switch off the buffer at the through. This means the pickup is now seeing the 10 mega ohms in parallel with the 50 kilo ohms. If we put the numbers into our formula, like we have on screen now, we can see that we here get a combined load of 49,751 ohms or just below 50 kilo ohms. Let's check it out. It's not level matched, so you probably won't hear much from the unbuffered signal. Here are the two versions level matched and back to back. A rather noticeable difference. 
So, your best bet is probably to get one of the specialized piezo preamps out there and learn to find your preferred stage sound with the whole spectrum of your signal. Some of them have the option of sending pre or post EQ through the XLR out. In this way, we can use the EQ on the preamp as a means to control the frequency response in our stage amp without it affecting the full range from the XLR. As mentioned, we'll be looking at a selection of popular preamps in a future video. Please feel free to comment below. Let me hear what you think of the tone differences from impedance to impedance. In a later video, I'll take you through some popular preamps with piezo buffers. There are quite a few options out there. Please subscribe and hit the bell to get notified when new content like this is posted. Until next time, thanks for watching and happy buffering.